posterity sake. All right, so he, um, here's an example of what the case study, let me call this up for a second here. This is kind of what the example is as far as the information to be provided. Often I'll have an a, a x-ray there available to you to kind of help you in your interpretation of what's going on. Here I'm telling you that it's an acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. I'm not always that generous. Um, and they give you a bunch of you know, laboratory data, physical assessment data, sometimes um, stuff that the patient is complaining about. She complains of severe dyspnea and productive cough. And then what I want you to do is complete a soap note. Now Mary went through soap notes, I believe. So you need to distinguish what information in that paragraph was considered subjective, what is objective. Based upon that objective and subjective data that you have, what kind of an assessment is going on? What do you think the problem is? So, for instance, if I'm seeing tachycardia, why is the patient tachycardic? If I'm seeing a patient who has a fever, why do they have a fever? One should drive the, the combination of the subjective and objective information that you derive should be able to say this is the problem that I'm seeing. Okay? You know, the tachycardia, the dyspnea, the increased respiratory rate are all due to the fact that the patient's PaO2 is low. Then, for what I have here, should drive what the plan is. Okay? So I'm taking, I'm evaluating my patient subjectively and objectively. I'm going ahead that, I shouldn't say I'm evaluating them subjectively, but I'm collecting what subjective data they, they, they provide. Um, figuring out what the pathophysiology is, and then go ahead and derive a plan of action that you would have. And it doesn't have to be long. Very brief, okay? I'm not I'm not looking for a dissertation. Huh? What's a dissertation? Dissertation is what you write to get your PhD or EDD. Yeah, that's what I Yeah. And it's a book. I think I, th I think mine was 250 pages. Um, <laughs> it was on. Um, the use of what's called a think aloud protocol to, to improve decision making in novice performers. So having an expert verbally express everything that they're thinking. Well, the purpose of it was is that this, on your clinical simulations that we do, the decision making is the part that people fail. They pass the, the information gathering, they just don't pass the, the decision making if they happen to fail it. Um, and part of that is, well, how do I glean what an expert would do in that situation? If I go into a patient's room in the ICU, there's a ton of information that's bombarding me. I'm, I'm filtering that out and taking what I need to and ignoring the rest. But how do I tell a student to do that? Someone who's a novice, who's the first time walking in the ICU, they're overwhelmed by all the information. And how do they go through and process what they need to? So, at any rate, but that's what the plan here is for um, for for the clinical sims or for the case studies. Okay, um, the thirty first a week from today, I'll give you the first one. I'll actually send it to you electronically. And what I want from you back is something sum submitted electronically, if you can. Okay. Anybody see a problem with that? Everyone have access to a word processor of some kind. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> some interesting data here. Um, I didn't know the current tax on cigarettes is two bucks a pack. Wow. That surprised me. But these were some grades that were given nationally. Uh, we were actually in the middle of the road as far as our, what we charge per pack. Um, but as far as what we're doing, <laughs> whoever this person was or the organization was is evaluating us, we don't do a real great job as far as having some kind of mechanism on the state level for promoting smoking cessation and for um, tobacco prevention. 
So are they uh, saying the figure it says should be higher because they... They're saying we're about, a, of all the states, we're in the middle of the pack. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the pack. <laughs> um, that, these numbers are, I think, a little bit old, but the economic costs are not only the costs of um, loss wages due to early disability, death, whatever, secondary to smoking, but also looking at um, cost of hospitalization, secondary to smoking. Um, the middle school, I, was, I, I just was looking at this morning, was 6.9% of middle school. That, that, that's, that just boggles my mind. And then they said in overall tobacco use was like 14%. So that means there's another 7% that are chewing. In middle school. Whoa! That, that just blew me away. So, um, something else was there I wanted to make a mention on. So, so bottom line is that it's still an issue. Um, even though we have smoke, we got we got to be in smoke-free air. <laughs> smoke-free restaurants was what drove 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 that. So just a review of the pathophysiology of chronic bronchitis. It's primarily an inflammatory response to chronic smoke, tobacco, um, pollution, occupational exposure, whatever, some kind of, of, of inflammation. That leads to, again, mucus production, smooth muscle constriction around those airways. And remember, it's the ones that are non-cartilaginous that are promoting collapse and the obstruction, you end up with hyperinflation to trap gas and obviously an increase in airway resistance as it is an obstructive defect. Okay? Just a review. Um, okay. Um, within history, you're going to take a lot of information as far as um, in, in interviewing the patient. Um, I guess I probably should have put gender there, shouldn't I have? Although um, there, there's a whole topic that I could do simply on uh, sexuality of the patient with chronic lung disease and how the fact, if you can't get your breath, it's going to Im 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 impair things like intimacy and other facts involved. So it, it, there's, there's a whole another realm there too. Uh, but there is a mechanism by which we can assess their dyspnea, and we'll go through those. Um, we'll talk about pack years in a little bit. Um, many times the cigarette smoking isn't the predominant factor. It's environmental or, or it's occupational. Okay? Uh, one of the great things we have done is made our homes extremely energy efficient by tightening them up. But in the process, you've also then indoor pollutants are still there. So... Especially when you talk about um, in other countries, especially um, some third world poor nations, that a lot of the cooking is done on an open flame inside the house, and it's not something that is vented effectively. So promotion of uh, um, airway problems can happen there. What medications are on? Hospitalizations are key because, again, one of the factors that um, go the gold standard looks at is prior uh, uh, exacerbations. So it, it does make a big difference. Whether they're on any oxygen therapy and then looking at the, uh, the, qua the color, the odor, the amount, the consistency, not the taste of any sputum samples I may be present. Because they do make a difference. Yet. Oh, you will. Like you can just smell you, like Oh, yeah. You can get there. You can get to the point where you go, yeah, that's pseudomonas. Okay, that's cool. Calculating pack years um, is basically just the number of packs per day and the number of years that they smoked. So if I smoke a half a pack a day for 40 years, I have 20 pack years. Same would be true if I smoke a pack a day for 20 years. Okay. And this is kind of an indication of the... Um, the quantity of the exposure that they end up happening. It's not only how many packs, it's, it's, not, it's not only, um, that's what I'm looking for here. It's duration as, as, as well as uh, the, how many packs per day you end up having. Does that ever take into account the non-smoker who just becomes a smoker? No. No? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what if they smoke 
you all you all have heard of secondhand smoke, obviously. Have you ever heard of thirdhand smoke? What is it? It's on your clothes and on and on the surfaces, and they're talking about children who being a third hand exposure. Never thought about that, but it, but, it, but it's true. Uh, no, they don't they don't take into account um, secondhand smoke. This is just as far as their direct exposure. It also doesn't take into account the extent to which you smoke the cigarette. Or well, a lot of people will light and let it burn, and then you know take a hit and let it burn, and they'll go. Well, somebody was smoking three three packs a day. Where do you find the time? <laughs> There's people I know that have like ashtrays like just throughout their house, mm -hmm. and they'll light one and like let it down, and then go to another room and forget, and then light another one. So they're if you're looking at the number of cigarettes they're smoking in a day, it's probably higher than their actual exposure. Okay. I actually have an ashtray at home that when you put a, when you put something into it, like, like a cigarette, that starts coughing. <laughs> it, and it's shaped like a lung. It's perfect. Oh, if, if, I, if, if I remember, I'll bring it in. Um, cough is one of the most common reported symptoms that they have. In most cases, it's, it's, not, it's, it's discounted by the patients. They, don't, they just see it as normal because it's been... I've had it for so long, it's just part of my normal process. And it's not. It's, an ab it's your body telling you there's something foreign there that, that shouldn't be there. Could be intermittent, could be um, worse at various points in time during, during the day. Um, and often it can be non-productive non also simply because it's an it, it's a, it's a irritant response as opposed to anything else. Okay. We can grade the severity of their dyspnea by, the prop, by, inter, by interviewing them and asking them specific questions. I do want you to know these, these different grades that, it, that, that exist. Grade one is what most of us would end up happening. If I go and I do something really foolish like exercise and run, I'm going to feel short of breath. I'm going to have a sensation that I can't catch my breath. That's normal. Okay. Actually, I'm probably closer to grade two because I'm getting old. But um, that would be where you're walking up a flight of stairs and you feel a little bit winded. Okay, It's different than the normal, but it's getting progressively worse. Grade three is where you're dis you ex the patient experiences dyspnea walking at a regular speed. So if there's two people that are 50 years old and one of the people can't keep up with the other one because they get winded, then they would be considered grade three dyspnea. So what they end up doing is they walk slower. Okay, they don't keep pace with someone their own their own age. Okay, and this is on level ground. Grade four is basically uh, well, walking short distances wins them. They're obviously worse than the prior one as far as keeping up with somebody. They're in. they can't even walk you know three hundred feet without getting winded okay and there is what we what we're going to call the six minute walk test which is a easy way of assessing whether or not someone desaturates we walk them for we measure their baseline oxygen saturation we walk them for six minutes how far they get in six minutes really depends on how bad they are um, but what we, we then remeasure their saturation and it's one of the things that we can use to qualify someone for home oxygen where if their baseline saturation or, or oxygen PaO2 is, is low enough, then we can go ahead and do a six minute walk test and see if when they exercise, they have a desaturation occur event occurring. And remember that group of patients would be patients with, di with diffusion defects, okay? Grade five is basically where they're dysmic all the time. They're not doing anything, they're sitting there like, a bump on a log and they're short of breath. Or doing things, that stands for, in case you have not seen that before, activities of daily living, shaving, cooking, bathing, whatever. They're short of breath. Okay? So you should be, if I give you a scenario, you should be able to distinguish which level of, um, or which grade of dyspnea I'm talking about. What do they look like as far as a physical ex 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 examination? They're going to have a prolonged exp expiratory phase 
So their I ratios typically are going to be 1 to 3, 1 to 4, as opposed to 1 to 2 for you and I. They may exhibit purse breathing, which is their attempt to maintain some positive pressure within their airways. Remember, these are the folks whose airways prematurely collapse during exhalation. So by using some purse breathing, we can keep the airways open longer. Um, I'll show you a picture of the tripod position because it just sounds wrong. They're in the tripod position. Uh, but they're using accessory muscles to ventilate with. Okay? They may have an increase in AP diameter as far as their, um, uh, their chest, so that they're the classic barrel chest, and they would have a reduced in tactile fremitus if you were to you know, place their hands on their chest and have them say something, you would end up feeling a reduced amount of, tran of transmission of that because of the air, the air trapping. This is the tripod position. And basically what they're doing is they're using their accessory muscles and they're, by planting their arms in this fashion, they're able to utilize those accessory muscles more effectively, but that's a very inefficient way to breathe. They're not utilizing their diaphragm to its fullest extent. So one of the things that we'll try and do is retrain them back out of this. And, you know, you'll eventually get to the point where you'll be standing in, the, in Myers in the checkout line and go, dude, that guy's got COPD. Go ahead, Stacy. Well, actually, they asked you, what you were saying, how do you retrain them if their diagrams are flat? They say they can't press air. Well, relieve the hyperinflation, for one. Um, through through medication, dilate di dilate the airways and allow them reduce the airflow limitation, but also then retraining it. I mean, the, the part of the reason that it's flat is it's not being used optimally. So if you retrain it, you can end up getting better oxygen utilization to ventilate. So the cost of breathing, the oxygen cost of breathing goes down. And this is an example of, of another person using the tripod position. Again, you can see the accessory muscle usage, the sternocleidomastoids, the scalenes, um, as far as ventilation. Uh, as far as uh, continuing on the physical exam, if you're looking at percussion, you would see a hyperresonant. Uh, they probably are tachycardic, which is most likely a response to the hypoxemia that they're exhibiting. Uh, PMI is what? <coughs> point of maximal impulse. So basically, where do you hear the heart sounds the loudest? Okay, and they're going to be re re reduced simply just because of the air trapping that you end up having. Probably these folks are going to be polycythemic. It's the body's response to chronic hypoxemias. They end up, uh, erythropoietin is uh, released, and you end up having more erythrocytes formed. Um, I don't know why they have a long S2, but they do. And then uh, you're going to have a lot of adventitious breath sounds that I know Mary has gone over with you until you want to vomit. Sputum production, you're going to see a large amount of it. Um, and it's probably, or especially during times where they're having an exacerbation doing an infection, it's going to change colors. Okay. And that's something we usually train them to, or to recognize is when you're seeing your sputum get thicker and changing colors, it's time to see your physician to get additional treatment. May see hemoptysis, um, may not. Uh, certainly clubbing can be, especially in, ex in um, severe cases, and they can have some paradoxical breathing where they're, on inspiration, you and I, our abdomens go out, as well as our chest getting larger, our thorax getting larger. What they do is the seesaw breathing where their diaphragm, because it's not functioning effectively and it's not moving, their abdominal contents actually move in. So as they create negative intrathoracic pressure with their accessory muscles, their diaphragm is actually pulled up and their abdomen is actually sucked in. So you see a paradoxical movement between their abdomen and their um, chest. And there is something called Hoover's sign, which is this inward movement of the lateral wall during inspiration. I think this guy, you can kind of see it here. This is kind of moving inward. The ribs are being sucked in during inspiration, which is not, not what you would expect to see. Here's just a picture of the barrel chest that develops 
because of the chronic hyperinflation, there actually is some morphology change in their body. And here's clubbing. You can see the, especially in the late stage, the distal phalanges um, end up de developing this bulbous nature. All right, let me just... I added this slide in today because I wanted to talk a little bit about this process. I tried to copy it, but it's too it was too big of a of a table. Let's see. So this is on page uh, 171 of your text, and it talks about two groups. Um, and this is again. You rarely will see someone who strictly has emphysema or strictly has chronic bronchitis. They're going to be basically a, a blend of the two. But if you did have someone who had strict emphysema, they actually have different, um, they present differently than someone with chronic bronchitis. We call them, we, just, we, we use a distinction of a pink puffer versus a blue bloater kind of an interesting way of putting it, but the pink puffer are the true emphysematous patients. They're typically a lot thinner in, in size. They typically have a very rapid respiratory rate. They're puffing, and they usually have a, a little bit of a reddish or pinkish condition. The blue bloaters, the true chronic bronchitic patients, um, picture Jabba the Hutt sitting there bloating and they're blue they're not breathing rapidly they're 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 just kind of there um they're typically more of the ones that have core pulmonal the blue bloaters as opposed to the pink puffers which which, which don't but take take a take a look at, at this at this table it kind of gives you a good breakdown between the two of them as far as what goes on yeah Part of it is that their metabolic activity is a whole lot higher, so they're breathing faster, and they typically, they do, they look more more thin. The COPD patients that have more of a prominent uh, chronic bronchitis are typically more overweight. Part of that overweight is also fluid re re retention because they're in congestive heart failure, right side of heart, heart, heart failure, but um, it's kind of the way that they end up being better answer than me. Okay, let me go back here. So take take a look at that. It might make a good question or two. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. EKGs, um, they typically have uh, uh, tachycardia present, sec secondary to the chronic hypoxemia. And they'll also have a right axis deviation. Mary talked about axis deviation, right? <coughs> okay, and this is a classic one that you have. If you remember... You have access deviation from either an enlarged part of the heart or damage on the opposite side. So a right access deviation would be found with somebody who has right ventricular hypertrophy, which they typically do. Okay. Uh, if the core pulmonal is there, I probably should qualify that. Okay. Chest x-ray, they're going to have, a, again, the key part is that hyperinflation with a uh, flattening of the diaphragm. Uh, we can use percussion, diagnostic percussion, to evaluate the extent to which the diaphragm moves. Um, and the heart, especially the, the non-core pulmonal patients, will be very long and narrow with reduced vascular markings simply because there's so much air there in the presence of blood, blood there below. So, I don't know how well you can see that, but I, I would say it's dark. <laughs> so there's a lot of hyperinflation involved. Uh, the space between the ribs are wider. Um, the diaphragm is flattened. There's a small heart in the center. Again, unless you had core pulmonal present, then, then that would not be true. And you can't really see vascular markings going out to the periphery well. 
And I don't know if there's blebs or bulli, but they would be there also. Okay. So pulmonary function tests for these folks would be, again, primarily a reduction in the airflow exhibited by reduced flow rates. Because they can't get the air out, they have an increase in trap gas exhibited by an increased FRC and TLC. They have a difference between their slow vital capacity and their forced vital capacity because of that dynamic compression that ends up happening, that equal pressure point being pushed further to the central, and you end up having more peripheral gas trapped. And we typically use body plethysmography to measure their lung volumes as opposed to helium dilution and nitrogen washout because of those areas that are trapped. You would never have them exposed with, with either of the other two tests. For emphysematous patients would have that reduction of diffusing <coughs> capacity, and we know what this flow volume loop would look like. Okay? And it's just talking about that dynamic compression that happens with a forced exhalation. And there's my scooped out flow volume loop. Again, FEV1 ratio is less than 40, is, is less than 70, so it's obstructive. And then we can look at the FEV1 to classify it as mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. Peak flows, I don't put a whole lot of weight on for COPD patients. I'd rather look at the FEV1 simply because it's a lung volume. And peak flows are very effort dependent, but certainly when you're getting less than 100 liters per minute, that's, that's pretty low. Um, but in an FEV1 less than one liter is probably a, indicative of a very severe ex exacerbation. Okay, a couple of things that, I, that I'm going to take a little bit slow here and stop me if I'm going too fast. First of all, not all patients with COPD are necessarily CO2 retainers. It's probably somewhere 10 to 20 percent of them are. So the, the observation, or not the observation, what's what I'm going to use, the general rule we have of using oxygen judiciously in patients with COPD really only pertains to 10 to 20 percent of the, of, the, of the COPD patients. Not every patient with COPD is necessarily going to be a patient who responds poorly to oxygen therapy. Mary talked about this, yes? No? Okay, then let me, let me, let me introduce you to the concept. Giving a patient with chronic lung disease excessive amounts of oxygen, more than they need to get their PaO2 up to 60, why 60? Because that's the steep part of the curve. Driving them higher than that can lead to a situation where they end up having a worsening of their hypoventilation. Their PCO2 ends up climbing because their ventilatory response goes down. You'll hear the term hypoxic drive that you and I breathe. Or, um, we do have a point at which when we become hypoxemic, our respiratory centers are stimulated. If you remember back, PO2 of 60, impulses go to the medulla oblongata to trigger the inspiratory centers. COPD patients, because their CO2s are so chronically elevated, the thought was that they only breathe because of their hypoxemia. That's the only stimulus they got left. So giving a patient oxygen with, uh, giving a patient with COPD oxygen takes away that hypoxic drive and therefore they don't breathe. Okay. Well, it's not entirely true. In fact, if it accounts for anything, it's probably 10% of the reasoning because they actually did studies where they've had patients with known CO2 retention, known um, or profound hypo hypoxemia. They gave them oxygen and they did, they monitored their diaphragm inter 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 innervation and the diaphragmatic innervation actually went up, not down. So it kind of showed, eh, it doesn't really work. There's a whole other reasoning and if you ever want, I'll sit down with you and explain what the other reasoning is, why that occurs. Bottom line is, there's a select group of patients, 10 to 20%, who end up having chronic CO2 retention, giving them oxygen therapy, worsens their CO2, makes them more acidotic, 
and potentially, I'll give you tell you a story. Went in, got a call from a nur uh, nurse. They wanted to get a blood gas on, on this one patient. Went into the room, poked her. She didn't move. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Um, got her PCO2 back, and her PCO2 was 130. That's a bit elevated. Her normal was about 60. She was long-term chronic patient. Well, what ended up happening, she went down to endoscopy. She was on a two-liter cannula. They ended up giving her some sedation for the procedure. She's hypoventilated. When you hypoventilate with a low-flow system, remember, with a low flow like a nasal cannula, the, the FiO2 changes depending upon the ventilatory pattern. So as she hypoventilated, she actually drew in more oxygen and less air. So her FiO2 actually went up, and her PO2 went up, and her breathing went down. <laughs> so had she been on, an, on a, uh, something like a, a high flow system, probably would not have been as severe of a, of a mismatch there. But at any rate, these folks have chronic respiratory acidosis. Over time, as their ventilatory impairment becomes more significant, their PCO2 starts rising. You know, a couple tore every month. Then what ends up happening is their bicarb is allowed to then rise with it. So what they end up having is a situation where they end up having a normalized pH, but a PCO2 that is extremely elevated and a bicarbonate level that has risen to compensate for it. Okay. Their PO2 is really dependent upon a lot of other factors, but certainly hypoventilation is going to lead to some hypoxemia. And in this case, it's primarily what it is. But there could be a diffusion defect, there could be VQ mis mismatching, all kind of other stuff going on too. They also have a large amount of dead space ventilation. They have a lot of wasted ventilation because they got a lot of trapped gas. It doesn't always get out. Okay. All right. Deep breath. Good. Okay. Remember everything I told you about blood gases before? Well, I got to twist that a little bit. Okay. If I have a patient who has those blood gases, okay, and they become, they, they develop an infection, they develop a little bit of perhaps a pneumonia, they develop a little bit worsening hypoxemia, secondary of the VQ mismatching, you're going to see with that. They then will increase their respiratory rate and hyperventilate. Okay. But their hyperventilation is from their normal. Follow me? They're hyperventilating from a normal of 64. And to raise their PO2, they breathe faster, and they drop their PCO2 to, let's say, 50. They drop it by 14 tor. What's going to happen to their pH? It's going to go up. Okay. They're going to create an alkalosis, or what's going to appear as an alkalosis. In fact, if you look at it, it'll actually be an uncompensated, we would classify it as an uncompensated metabolic alkalosis. Okay or a partially compensated met metabolic alkalosis. Because their CO2 is elevated. Let me do it in here. Oh. So they go from these blood, they go from these blood gases to let's say 7.47, 50, and a bicarb of 35. How would we classify that? Partially compensated metabolic alkalosis, right? But it's not. It's a respiratory alkalosis superimposed on a chronic ventilatory failure. Oh, man, you just lost me. Okay. This is a situation where a patient has a chronic condition. Their normals are not our normals. So you have to take that into account as you're evaluating this patient. Okay? So 
So what ends up happening is they end up having a hyperventilation. So there, it's basically a respiratory alkalosis for them superimposed on a chronic ventilatory failure. We call this an acute on chronic. How am I doing? Okay. If I just saw that blood gas, I have no idea what it is. I would classify it as a partially compensated metabolic al alkalosis. But knowing that I have a COPD patient, that changes the entire focus of it. Because now I know that they got a chronic problem. They're in chronic ventilatory failure. But just now they have an exacerbation which has twisted it around, so now they hyperventilate from their normal to a lower level. Okay? This happens a lot. How do you switch it over to normal then? I mean, well, a lot of times they'll have a um, an old an old blood gas before before discharge from a prior <coughs> prior so mission. Just like, yeah, just by looking at the yeah, look, looking at past past data. Okay. All right. Let's take it a step further. So here's my here's my chronic ventilatory baseline values, right? 739, 76 PCO2, 41 bicarb. Okay. They end up having a situation where they have an acute hyperventilation happening. So they hyperventilate from 76 to, 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 to 51. And their bicarb probably initially wouldn't change much, but you can see that's why they're hyperventilating is because of that PaO2. Agreed? So looking at this blood gas out of, out of context, I'm going to call it a partially compensated metabolic al alkalosis. If I knew this blood gas was their normal functioning one that they have as their baseline, I would say, no, no, no. This is an acute hyperventilation superimposed on that chronic ventilatory failure. Does that make sense? Casey's giving me a weird look. Yeah, but it has to the same camera and thing. Okay. So what you're saying is that is that physical therapy or the ventilation is what Well, at this point, the oxygen therapy would certainly be useful. Why are they hyperventilating? They're hypoxic, yeah. Give them some oxygen. Give them some something to improve their ventil their ventilatory function. Maybe, you know, albuterol. It's good for everything else. Why not, why not use it on a patient that might be indicated for? So it's more normal for them. It's not something. No. This is normal. The center one. That's their normal. This is actually their response to some insult. Something is causing that PO2 to drop. So they're hyperventilating just like you, you and I would. Go ahead, Dana. Well, how long does it take for the bicarb to change? A couple days. A couple days. So this person, if this is what they were normally at, this is probably a day or two into the process. But by that point in time, he's really hyper. I mean, how hard is it to drop P PCO2 by 25 tor? That's a lot of ventilation. Um, you have to basically, I think it, the rule is quadruple ventilation to have CO2. So we got to increase minute ventilation by four fourfold to have the PCO2 cut in half. So that's a lot of ventilation he's doing here. Okay. Okay. How long can they hyperventilate like that for? Eventually they're going to get tired, aren't they? They're going to poop out. At some point along the line, they only got so much gas in the tank, they're going to run out of gas. I got to pause. Which is what they do. They get pooped out and they go back the other way. Now they can't ventilate anymore. Now their PCO2 rises. 
now they become profoundly acidotic and hypoxemic. Because the bicarb ain't got time to catch up. Okay. Here's the problem. Where am I catching them? If I got a normal blood gas, doesn't mean that they're normal for them, or does it mean that they're coming back across? Ew. Well, if they're coming back across, if they're coming from this acute hyperventilation, getting tired and pooped out, are they going to look like they're normal? No. They're going to look fatigued. They're not going to be using accessory muscles where normally they would be because they just ran out of gas. Okay. Harleen. Often they do, yeah. Um, can they can they just go from this chronic state to the left? Absolutely. More often than not, though, they're probably going hyperventilating first and then pooping out. Now, when we see them, we may already see them. When 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 this part was was at was, was at home two days ago, and now they've gotten so so bad that we're just seeing them on the on the other end. Emily and Har Harleen, let me ask you guys. The first time you heard this last year, was it confusing? Yes, I made sense at first. So it does make sense eventually. That's, that, that's the good news, guys. It was. Yeah. Because he wears, like, um, just, like, and stuff. And, like, you're studying, it'll always say from what has, like, a chronic, like, condition. So that's kind of, like, what it's just saying. That's right. Is that basically the same thing on the right hand side right now? And the left hand side, absolutely. In fact, some people would argue, depending upon the severity of the underlying, of what's causing the exacerbation, tube them here. Why let them fail? Why let the muscles totally fatigue? We don't think about it that much, but the diaphragm is really made up of two different types of fibers. It's made up of um, slow, slow twitch and fast twitch. Ha, ha, ha. One, one type of fiber is designed for um, endurance. One type of fiber is designed for strength. You need to generate a lot of intrathoracic pressure for defecation and childbirth and that kind of stuff. But the diaphragm is designed to beat 12 times a minute for the rest of your life. It's an endurance muscle. If we fatigue, we run the risk of taking that endurance muscle and pushing it so far that we end up doing damage to it. It's just like a runner can take their, if they, if, 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 if they, tire and keep on running, they can actually worse and do some damage to their to their muscles. That's why I don't run. So um Desjardin, page sixty five in Desjardin, three seven three oh seven and three oh eight in Egan. The page numbers are wrong in your things, so you may want to change them. They both go through a good explanation of what I just went through. Sixty five in Desjardin. 307, 308, and Egan. Okay. It's called the acute on chronic. Acute hyperventilation superimposed on chronic ventilatory failure. I mean, technically, the same thing would be true if I had somebody who had renal failure and had blood gases screwed up from, from that. You can have an acute on chronic, too, but we, we, we won't get there yet. Okay. Probably one of the harder concepts that you'll get this semester. But it, it's very, very common, okay? And the hard part is when I'm in this middle part, I get a blood gas back and they look normal pH. Does that correlate with what they're showing me? Does the blood gas look like what I would expect it to? If I got a patient who's barely able to breathe and I get a normal blood gas, it's like, hmm, something's wrong here. So every, everything I told you before was all was was all wrong. So just so you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm in theory, in theory, if somebody has a mild or moderate level, they would just the swings wouldn't be as big, but certainly in the severe, very severe category, this is what you'll end up seeing. Correct. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. 
they would be normal if everything was okay. So in other words, if they didn't have an acute exacerbation, their blood gases would be normal. They walk around every, every day like that. Pardon me? Normal for, 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 for them. That is the key part to remember. But when you're seeing that and they're not breathing normally, they're definitely looking like they're in distress, then you end up saying, nah, tube them. We got an impending failure here. Okay. Okay. Other things that you want to look at, since I can't just let you go yet. We said that polycythemia might, might be there with an increased hematocrit. Um, they may, if they're in an, an acute uh, exacerbation from a pneumonia, have, a, have an increase in white blood cells, especially neutrophils, indicating some kind of infection. Most common things that we would culture would probably be streptococcus pneumoniae. That's the one most common community-acquired um, infection in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. Actually, in the general population, it's true, too. That's why we give them the pneumococcal vaccine, because it reduces the incidence of that. You can also just have a uh, hemophilus influenza, um, which is kind of a secondary one that they end up seeing to encounter a whole lot. Bottom line is we want to culture it, get a sputum specimen, culture it to be identified so we can identify what organism is present and the term sensitivity means I want to be able to identify which antibiotics it is sensitive to. So that's a two-step process. They'll do, do a gram stain and a culture and then they'll go ahead and do a sensitivity to, to, to evaluate it. Yes. Quick question. I've seen these in some of the scripts that are sputum cultures times three, like they want three consecutive ones. Is it, just you know, just for, like, I, I, I would imagine the reasoning is because they want to make sure, because on one specific specimen that you may get spike. might not be accurate or might not be totally might be conclusive. Might not be present or something else. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, just as a, as a review as far as some of the uh, values, if I were to look at um, CVP, what's the normal value? Anybody remember? Two to six. Four to 12 on the other side. 25 over eight. We should talk to the second years who were just going, going through this. And they're going, I don't remember this. I said, sucks to be you. Right? 120 over 80? It's a normal blood pressure in them? Okay. All right. What they have is they have an elevation in, the, in their CVP level, especially when you start developing chronic um, right side or heart failure. They have that core pulmonal picture. Chronic hypoxemia not only leads to the production of more hemoglobin, polycythemia, it also is a potent pulmonary vasoconstrictor. That pulmonary vascular resistance going up combined with the loss of capillaries, secondary destruction of the alveoli that you end up having with, with emphysema leads to the fact that their pulmonary hypertension is present. That high blood pressure in the, or that high amount of resistance in the pulmonary system causes the right heart to work harder, which is why you end up developing right ventricular hypertrophy. Cause the right heart can't pump blood out as effectively, it backs up, and it backs up into things where you end up seeing things like jugular vein distension, ascites, peripheral edema, and gorge liver, etc. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it, there, there's a whole separate set of medications that you would use for pulmonary hypertension that you wouldn't use for systemic hyper, hypertension, um, but I don't know why beyond that. Uh, I'm going to let that go. All right, so basically if you have your FEV1 greater than 50%, you have, if you stop smoking, if you start 
managing it has pretty good mortality. Problem is we don't catch it till it's later than that, um, so you end up having a higher mortality from COPD as that FEV1 falls. And when you get down to having something less than 20% FEV1 percent predicted, you end up having extremely high mortality, especially within a year. I mean, a one-year mortality of 30% is not good. And this is kind of the problem that we end up having. Because I'm, I have this, this, this disease, my activity goes down. I may not be able to work anymore. I can't go much further than the bathroom. I decondition, decondition, and then finally go right down the drain. Okay. And that's a, that's a classic picture that you end up seeing. You don't have this slide, do you? Do you? You should be able to memorize that, right? It's harder to read. This is um, kind of the different. It's, it's targeting how we're going to manage manage this patient, but looking at things like stopping smoking, looking at things like various agents that are going to inhibit the release of all those things that cause inflammation. Um, looking at things to, uh, because that protease is breaking down the, the, the alveolus, maybe there's something we can do to inhibit that. I mean, there is medi med medications that we can end up giving. And for all that mucus, there's mucolytics and other things that we can do to regulate how much mucus is produced. For right, for right now, we'll talk about that when we talk about treatment. It just kind of like is an overview of what, di what directions we, we can end up going. And I think we'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs>